taking a class here, but let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Our Father, we're, we're appreciative of the opportunity we have to gather together. We're grateful, Lord, for this world that you've created and how you are blessing it and how you are blessing us. Uh, we thank you for, for your word, Lord, and how it leads us and guides us and uh, how it causes us to worship you. Help us to, to know more about you, know more about your spirit today, and may it affect um, not just our minds, but our hearts. May it increase our affection for you, and may it also inspire us, Lord, with a, uh, a sense of the mission to which you've called us and for which you are empowering us by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so um, just a, a brief, re it's 75 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> uh, just a brief recap on um, where, we've, uh, where we were last week, um, looking at the Holy Spirit in David. <clears throat> so we saw in 1 Samuel 16, 18, this extraordinary passage where David is introduced to Saul, but he's also introduced to us, um, looking for someone who can play the, the liar skillfully and drive away the spirit of distress that has come upon Saul. And one of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. We saw how each of these qualities uh, extraordinarily matches up with um, aspects of the empowering of the Holy Spirit that we've come across so far in this class. David is skillful in playing the lyre, which matches up with the creative skill that the Holy Spirit gave to Bezalel and Aholiab, that he's a man of valor which matches up with the personal courage and might of someone like Samson. That he's a man of war, um, which goes along with the military skill of someone like Joshua and all the different judges. That he's prudent in speech, which matches up with the practical wisdom that the Holy Spirit empowered Joseph with. That, he has, that he's a man of good presence, having authority. Uh, and that matches up with the judges as they called individuals to follow them into um, battle. And that Yahweh is with him. And we also noted how David possessed all of this before it says the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. All of these empowerings, all these character qualities David already possessed. <clears throat> so it speaks to the way that the Holy Spirit is active even when it's not described in Scripture. And then at the other end of David's career, as it's presented in Scripture, we have 2 Samuel 23, 1 through 2. These are the last words of David, the oracle of of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel, the spirit of the Lord speaks by me. So the Holy Spirit is here linked to uh, a, a new category, and that is written revelation, something that we take for granted, so to speak, um, based upon our knowledge from the, the New Testament, but here it's specifically talked about in the Old Testament. Then we looked at Ruach in the Psalms. Uh, it occurs 38 times, but all, most of those times are referring to wind or to man's spirit. Uh, there are only five passages um, where the Ruach can be said to be God's Ruach, the Ruach of, of the Lord. And we took a, a long time and looked at Psalm 51, how Ruach is used four different times in that psalm. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord makes his first explicit appearance in verse 11. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
what is David talking about when he says, take not your Holy Spirit from me? <clears throat> On the one hand, it certainly mirrors his personal experience with Saul. He doesn't want to have happened to him what happened to Saul. The Holy Spirit was taken away from him, and he goes from being courageous and a bold leader of men to being um, captured by uh, jealousy and anxiety and fear and no longer a leader. All the battles subsequently are um, won by David. <clears throat> but we also saw that take not your Holy Spirit from me, particularly because it's paired with cast me not away from your presence. That there may be something different, something um, more personal something closer to the indwelling of the spirit that we know from the Old Testament. This pairing of God's spirit and God's presence occurs in two other psalms. So I, I mentioned there are only five psalms that um, talk about the spirit of the Lord. And three out of those five psalms mention the spirit of the Lord and link him with God's presence. So Psalm 104, when you hide your face or your presence, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Also in Psalm 139, 7, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? We also looked at verse 10 and how that's the pivot point of the, of the psalm. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Up until that point in time, all he's talking about is his sin and his need for God's mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, purge me, wash me, hide your face, blot out. But the problem remains, he has this sinful nature. And what he comes up with in verse 10 is he needs something completely new. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He doesn't need the same old heart washed and cleansed. He needs a, a clean heart, a new heart. And he needs a right spirit, a steadfast spirit, one that is clean and will stay clean. The Spirit is the one in Psalm 104 who creates and who renews. So what David is asking for here is regeneration. And we see then that although we haven't gotten to the New Testament and what it means for the extraordinary gifting of the Holy Spirit, we see that the Old Testament believer also had the Spirit in very important and significant ways. Uh, there, there's no way for an Old Testament saint to be regenerated apart from the work of the Spirit. There's no way for Old Testament saints to manifest uh, the fruits of the Spirit without the Spirit's presence in their, in their lives. So we, we can't make some sort of clear delineation that there, there is no presence of the Holy Spirit in Old Testament believers' lives. Yet there is something new and special that happens in uh, the New Testament era after Christ's res resurrection and his um, exaltation. Um, but we haven't gotten to that part yet. So thus far in the course, we've been going through the Old Testament and looking at those places that talk about the spirit of the Lord, the Ruach of Yahweh. Uh, where the Spirit of the Lord is explicitly mentioned and seeing what we can learn about God's Spirit. Today, we're going to consider not one particular passage that speaks of the Ruach, Ruach of God, but we're going to be looking at a particular image or symbol or a manifestation of the Spirit. So I wanted to begin by asking a broad question. What are some of the symbols Symbols of the Holy Spirit or manifestations 
of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. What are some of the symbols, manifestations of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, the dove is New Testament. I'll put it down here. How, how does it? A bird. Well, the Holy Spirit hovered, similar to the bird that's mentioned. <laughs> okay, it, it might be a dove. Um, the, where does the dove appear in the Old Testament? Two places, for sure. There may be more. Uh, Noah, right? The dove going from the ark. So um, a lot of preachers I've heard m are making connection between the dove and Noah's ark and the Holy Spirit. I don't know. That might be a little bit tenuous. Um, <clears throat> also in the sacrificial system, right? Doves are given in sacrifice. Okay. But that's New Testament. What are some? There's lots of them. So what are some symbols, manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? Uh, the lampstand and the tabernacle. Okay. Lampstand, good. Good. We have a couple dozen to go. Yeah. Pardon me? Cloud. Cloud. The, the, the Lord God led the people of Israel by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. And when, when God comes and fills his sanctuary, it comes down in a cloud. Same thing happens on the Mount of Transfiguration, a cloud. These are Trinitarian scenes. We have Jesus, we have God the Father speaking, and we have the Holy Spirit manifested in a cloud. I don't know, I forget what the story is, but the floating axe head, I don't know if that's... The, the floating axe head? Yeah. That's an interesting story. I don't know what we could connect with a symbol or a manifestation of the Holy Spirit there. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was. <coughs> yeah. Yes. OK. What are um, some? Obvious ones that we've talked about in the class a number of times. Wind. Wind. And yeah, OK, good. What are some, OK, so we're thinking in terms of objects and things, right? symbols, manifestations, that, that makes sense. But a lot of times, the Holy Spirit isn't so much linked with a thing, an object, or an image, as he is with a, a verb, an activity. This is really uh, interesting how this plays out. Um, it it, it kind of makes sense, because the Spirit is so hard to hold on to as, you know, as we're thinking about who the Holy Spirit is. And we know him more by what he does, right, than manifestations. But what are some of the things that the Holy Spirit, maybe you could think of some of the things that the Holy Spirit does. Okay, good. Yeah, rushing. 
he rushes, he comes upon, builds, oh, fills, yeah, the Holy Spirit um, filled, this is a New Testament term, right, be filled with the Holy Spirit, but he filled a holy ebb, but he also builds. Uh, I'm going to give you three in a row. Washes, anoints, and clothes. So you come in dirty from the field, because we're all out in the field <laughs> working. You come in dirty from the field, and you need to get cleaned up. We're all filthy sinners. We need to, in, in a uh, Palestinian uh, context, um, we need to wash. Uh, then we need to anoint. Okay, the, the actual anointing process really be, reflects uh, cultural practices, right? You, the, your, your skin gets uh, dry and chapped, and you want it to be soft and supple and clean. and. So there's washing, then there's oiling with perfumes involved, and clothing. The Holy Spirit does all of those things. He washes, cleans, he anoints, and he clothes. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what do you, we have? Wash, anoint, and clothe. All right. We're going to spend the rest of the class talking about this one. So I hope you're not disappointed. <laughs> Uh, there's so many different manifestations of the Holy Spirit to, to choose from. And I thought, particularly um, picking up with David, that that would be a good launching point. So turn to um, 1 Samuel 16, 1. <clears throat> The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Then go down to verse 11. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. So we see this pairing of Samuel anointing David and the Holy Spirit rushing upon him, this, this connection. <clears throat> I've already mentioned how um, anointing is not necessarily a special word. Um, it's, not the, it's not the same word, but a, a word for anointing is used in other texts, like Ruth is told, wash therefore and anoint yourself and put on your cloak. Um, David is mourning the, um, and praying to God um, to revive the son that he had by Bathsheba. Uh, there's no name for that child. Um, and the child dies. 
And David washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. So this is part of that three-step process that's familiar to their culture, but it's really what the Holy Spirit does with us. Washed, uh, anointed himself with oil, and changed his clothes. But what we're talking about today is a special anointing. So what do we think is, what's the main idea behind anointing? What's the significance of anointing? What does it mean? Yeah. Okay. okay. Good. It's one. Yes. Yeah. being set apart to do God's will, being set apart for a particular purpose. It's a commissioning. A couple other things. Army? Yep, same thing as set apart. Yep, consecrate. Mm-hmm. The spirit, well, it is the spirit coming. The, the, the significance of anointing is that the Holy Spirit is upon the person. That's the, that's the, whole, the whole point. The Holy Spirit is upon the person to set them apart for a particular purpose and God does it. You say, well, God does it. Samuel did it. Yeah. Samuel anointed David on God's behalf. Okay. So you're going to see repeated, um, if you were to investigate it, we're not going to have a chance to look at a lot of these passages, but you'll see repeated references to the, the Lord's anointed. Okay. And God will say, I have anointed you. He does it through his human anointers. Usually two classes of people do the anointing, just FYI, either priests or prophets. I think almost all the anointing in the Old Testament is done by priests or prophets. Except maybe the first one. Does anyone know, this is Bible trivia time, uh, does anyone know where anointing first occurs in Scripture? Genesis. <laughs> Could you be a little bit more specific? The first half? Well, there's, 20, there's 50 chapters, so the first half would be chapters 1 through 25. So, wrong. It's not in the first half. It's in the second half. Hey, Brother Earl. Anyone know where the first anointing occurs in Scripture? Genesis 28, uh, verses 10 and following. You can turn there if you want. Um, Jacob is um, heading to Haran, um, and he stops off, and he, let's see, verse t- Genesis 28, verse uh, 11, and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. 
And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Uh, Down to verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name, or Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. So this was a special place, and the stone was a special stone for Jacob to set it apart from all of the other stones. Jacob pours oil on it. He he anoints it. He did the same thing in Genesis 35 when God renamed him Israel. He also sets up a pillar there and anoints it with oil. So that's the first reference to anointing something with oil in Scripture. Uh, There are a whole lot of other objects, however, that are anointed. And scripture talks about them quite a bit, especially in the first five chapters. What are some of the other objects that are, not people, objects that are anointed with oil? Any idea? So throughout Exodus and uh, Leviticus, with a couple references in Numbers as well, the tabernacle and everything in it, all of the furniture and the utensils of the tabernacle are anointed with oil. And unleavened bread, if it comes in the loaf form, I guess, has to, well, it's not a loaf, but it talks about Um, bread with the oil in it, or if it's a wafer, then you're going to anoint the wafer with oil. So you can see the clear connection between things that are set apart, they're consecrated, okay? The, The tabernacle is not just any building and all of the things in it. A lampstand is a common item, but this is a special lampstand. It's anointed with oil set apart. So what class of people are the first people anointed in scripture? What group of people? Somebody speak aloud what you're thinking in your head. The priests, yes. Turn to Exodus chapter 40. Exodus 49 through 15. So this is the Lord speaking to Moses. Then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it and all its furniture so that it may become holy, set apart. You shall also anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar so that the altar may become most holy. You shall also anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate it. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall wash them with water and put on Aaron the holy garments and you shall anoint him and consecrate him that he may serve me as priest. Washing, clothing, anointing. These, these three activities go together so many times in Scripture, and they all three represent different activities of the Holy Spirit. You shall anoint him and consecrate him that he may serve, serve me as priest. 
You shall bring his sons also and put coats on them and anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may serve me as priests. And their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual priesthood about their generations. So what happened after Moses does this? Constructs the tabernacle, anoints everything in it, and Aaron and his sons in verses 34 Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Glory is another, I can hardly call it an image. I mean, how do we even picture what glory is? But cloud and glory, another representation of the Holy Spirit. So we've talked about how anointing signifies being set apart. Um, There's a text that makes that even clearer. Uh, If you turn over to Leviticus 21. We could infer from the text that we've read about how the purpose of anointing is to set something apart. But this, this passage in Leviticus makes it very clear. Leviticus 21, verses 10 through 12. The priest who is chief among his brothers, on whose head the anointing oil is poured and who has been consecrated to wear the garments, shall not let the hair of his head hang loose nor tear his clothes. He shall not go into any dead bodies nor make himself unclean, even for his father or for his mother. He shall not go out of the sanctuary, lest he profane the sanctuary of his God, for the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is on him. I am the Lord. He is set apart. Even where he lives needs to be restricted. <clears throat> Does anybody remember in your reading, you know how you read through the Bible in a year? Some of us make it past Leviticus. And some of us don't, but does anybody remember from their Bible reading anything special about the anointing oil itself? It had a very particular recipe, and it was not that recipe was not allowed to be copied or used for anything. Exactly. So turn to Exodus 30. Those who are anointed are set apart, but the actual oil of anointing, the anointing oil itself is something special and set apart. Exodus 30, verse 22 and following. The Lord said to Moses, take the finest spices of liquid myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet-smelling cinnamon, half as much, that is 250, and 250 of aromatic cane, and 500 of cassia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hen of olive oil. And you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil, blended as by the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tent of meeting, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all its utensils, and the lampstand and its utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burning offering of burnt offering with all its utensils and the basin that stand you shall consecrate them that they may be most holy whatever touches them will become holy you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests and you shall say to the people of Israel This shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on the body of an ordinary person, and you shall make no other like it in composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it or whoever puts uh, puts any of it on an outsider shall be cut off from his people." So anointing is special. Even the anointing oil is holy, is set apart. In the next chapter, the people that make it are the people that have been filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Bezalel, Aholiab. Uh, I have given t- uh, to all able men ability. Um, that's the Lord speaking of the Holy Spirit. They're the ones who manufacture this initial oil. Okay. Okay, except for those couple references to Jacob anointing the pillar, virtually all references in the first five books of the New Testament are to anointing things, the tabernacle and its contents, the unleavened wafers, and to people. All priests, beginning with Aaron and his sons and all later priests, are anointed. The emphasis in the historical books is completely different. What kind of people are anointed in the historical books? Priests and the Pentateuch and who in the historical books? Kings, leaders. Mm -hmm. It all begins, uh, there's a very brief reference in Judges uh, 9, the, um, the fable that that uh, fellow Jotham told the trees once went out to anoint a king over them and they said to the olive tree remember it ends up being the the bramble the thorn bush <laughs> um, that's the first reference to anointing somebody or something other than uh, a priest uh, it's a king but throughout first Samuel beginning with Saul in first uh, Samuel 10 verse 1 Then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him and said, has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? So we've talked about how um, anointing means to set apart and it's for a particular purpose. Uh, In the the priest's case, uh, the anointing is to serve in a a religious capacity as priests. They are set apart as holy, set apart as set (laughs) set apart. What are kings anointed for? What purpose, what particular purpose are kings set apart for? Why are they anointed? Hmm? Okay. Good. So that so that they will have authority. Uh huh. There you go. Good. Yeah. Kings are anointed as kings to and commissioned for a particular purpose, and that is to serve as God's vice regents. Uh, just like we all were back in the garden. We're all supposed to have dominion over creation. One commentator, this title expressed the king's vassal status as the Lord's earthly representative and his consecration to and authorization for divine service. You notice in that that um, 1 Samuel 10, where Samuel says, has not the Lord anointed you? And they're also set apart through the anointing as having a special empowering relationship with God, with the Holy Spirit, with the Spirit of the Lord. Sometimes it's very specific tasks. So in 2 Chronicles 22, It says of Jehu, whom the Lord anointed to destroy the house of Ahab. And very interesting, in Isaiah 45, Cyrus is described as the Lord's anointed. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belt of kings, to open doors before him, that gates may not be closed. He had a specific task Cyrus did from the Lord in restoring 
the um, people back to the Holy Land. So Samuel anoints Saul with a flask of oil. But when it comes to David, God instructs him to fill your horn with oil. Uh, that might be representative of a greater dispensing of the Holy Spirit. So throughout 1 Samuel and Kings uh, Chronicles, we see this reference to anointing of kings. Uh, Absalom, uh, David has Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint Solomon. Um, Elisha tells a son of the prophets to anoint Jehu, etc. Keeps on going. There's one exception. So far we've seen priests and kings, but in 2 Kings, the Lord tells Elijah to anoint Elisha as a prophet in your place. This is the only reference to anointing a prophet in the Old Testament. Two categories, primarily uh, administrative leaders, uh, judges and prophets, uh, judges and kings, rulers and prophets. Interestingly, the priestly class in our survey of all the different people who the Holy Spirit has come upon, none of them are priests. Okay? Uh, Moses, Joseph, um, the 70 elders, all the judges. Um, we have Balaam, the prophet, all these different people that the, the Holy Spirit has come upon, but none of them are priests. But the priests are covered in this anointing group. So, okay, just to sum up, we've seen two classes of people, priests and kings, one reference to a prophet, how is the group of anointed people expanded in the Psalms? We're going through the Old Testament looking at anointing. We've seen the Pentateuch, we've seen the historical books. When the Psalms comes along, things open up and different people are referred to as being anointed. Any ideas? All right, turn to Psalm 28. Twenty-eight verses eight and nine. <clears throat> the Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Oh, save your people and bless your heritage. <clears throat> Be their shepherd and carry them forever. So this is a rather obscure reference. It's not like this is repeated over and over again in the Old Testament. But we see here a reference to the people of God being anointed. Uh, Habakkuk 3, verse 13. You don't have to turn there says um, something similar. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. So we see a pretty huge expansion of this group of people who are anointed from priests and kings now to the people at large. It's kind of preparing us for what's to come, right? In the New Testament. The other, I can't say group of people because it's only one person that the Psalms talks about as being anointed is the Messiah. Okay, so turn to Psalm chapter two. Psalm two. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And the rest of the psalm, I'm not going to read through it all because we're pretty familiar with it, talks about this anointed one in categories that is 
that are very familiar to us um, that seem very much like Jesus, could only be talking about Jesus. How do we know that this is, in fact, a messianic psalm? Do we have any evidence from scripture that this is most definitely a messianic psalm? Good. Mm -hmm. But there's an explicit reference to this psalm and scripture that links the anointed one with Jesus. It's in Acts 4. Peter and John were released from prison. They go back. <clears throat> the kings, uh, he, uh, wait, let's see, verse 24. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Quoting Psalm 2. For truly in this city they were gathered to the, together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. So the Messiah, Jesus, is the anointed one. And one more passage, uh, Psalm 45, verse 7. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Um, Hebrews 1 refers to that verse and says it's referring to Jesus. So the the Psalms paved the way then for what is the most well-known anointed passage in scripture, and that would be Isaiah 61, verses one through three. We're gonna spend the rest of our time here and in the New Testament. Isaiah 61, one through three. So Jesus quotes this passage uh, when he's in his hometown. He goes to the synagogue, and uh, he stands up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolls the scroll, and he finds the place where this is written. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Now, he doesn't quote that whole passage, but he quotes the first half of it. So we see an explicit connection here between anointing and the Holy Spirit. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. How does this Isaiah passage refer, relate to commissioning? What are the specific sorts of things that this anointed one is commissioned to do? Bring good news, okay? To proclaim. proclaim. What, which office would that be linked with? Hmm? Prophet. Prophet, yeah. What else is he called to do? To 
give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. I'm sorry? Okay. And who, what office would that participate in? Yeah, it's, a, it's the action of a king, the action of a deliverer. But you notice how much more expansive this is than the kind of deliverance that uh, Othniel or Gideon or Saul or even David provided. We see then in the different offices in the Old Testament, we see in the human representatives only hints of the great fulfillment that comes in the Messiah and the Lord. They're barely suggestions of the sort of radical deliverance that is provided by the Messiah. All they are is sort of intimations. The Holy Spirit is empowering them to provide a deliverance of sorts, but it's temporary, it's transitory, and it's insignificant in comparison to the sort of deliverance that the anointed one provides here. So when would we say that Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit? Yes. At his baptism, yeah. The Holy Spirit came upon him. And John makes a point. It doesn't just come upon him, but he remains on him. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an extension of the, the kingly deliverance in intimate ways that we don't, we don't see any of the Old Testament kings and judges providing that sort of intimate, personal, uh, tender deliverance. But it also <clears throat> speaks to, and sort of getting ahead of ourselves, but that's okay because it's 1040, um, speaks to the sort of anointing that we receive and to which we are, the, the responsibility to which we're commissioned. Yeah, so it's just another case of um, people settling for something much less. They want a political deliverance, and Jesus is interested in a absolutely thorough, personal deliverance. Turn to Acts 10, 38. This is a somewhat controversial topic. Um, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. <laughs> but where does Jesus get his power? Well, 
well, he's God, right? <laughs> but he, he's also man. So where does he get the power to do the things that he does? Through the Spirit. Verse uh, th- uh, 10, verse 37. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Those are synonyms. <laughs> the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For There's our other phrase, for God was with him. The Holy Spirit empowered the man, Jesus, the man, the, the man of the God-man. I have not investigated this enough to speak definitively about it. Did Jesus, when he performed miracles, call upon his divine um, nature? Or is it the Holy Spirit, him being empowered by the Holy Spirit, in a completely new way, in a complete way, uh, a full way, that the we've, we've been uh, prepared for this, right? In the Old Testament so far, all the different people that we've seen empowered and all the strange ways that they've been empowered. Uh, so with Jesus drawing on his divine nature to perform miracles and do all these things, or is it the empowering of the Holy Spirit? Robin, you going to answer that question for us? I think it was the Holy Spirit because when the uh, Pharisees said that it was of the devil, that's what Christ said, he made me part of the sin. Okay. Maybe we can look at that. Yeah. And I think the examples that you reminded us of in the Old Testament of how many individuals were uh, empowered by the Spirit, the Spirit was there to enable them Finally, we have somebody in the person of Christ who fully trusted in the Spirit um, and was empowered in a way to obey God in every aspect. Hmm. So that, that frustration that creates yearning in the Old Testament for somebody who, if, if anyone is going to be filled with the Spirit, is finally going to obey God and not just lead us into a worse position. Hmm. Wonderful. So let's close with um, 2 Corinthians 1, 21. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us. We've been talking all class about anointing. Has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Paul here is actually saying the same sort of thing four different ways, okay? God who, established, number one, establishes us with you in Christ. Number two, has anointed us. Number three, who has also put his seal on us. And number four, given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Anointing and all these other aspects of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. In fact, these are a couple other images which we haven't, they're New Testament images, but the seal and the guarantee or the earnest are a couple other um, symbols of the Holy Spirit. In, uh, in 1 John chapter 2, um, John says that the believers have been anointed by the Holy One and they all have knowledge. Um, the knowledge of the truth uh, that comes from the scripture and from their application of it is a, the anointing of the spirit in practice. Uh, the last question I had, we don't have time for, but how does this anointing of the Holy Spirit relate to our commission? So you can have the, the rest of the week to think about that. 
um, what does this anointing mean for us? If we're anointed, if we, if we are, as God's children, set apart for a particular purpose, what is that purpose to which we've been set apart? And how does the Holy Spirit fully enable us to uh, accomplish what we've been called to do? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the fullness of your word and for how we can trace a simple concept like your anointing and see how over the course of your scripture, how you unfold it, um, you show its meaning, the, the depth of its meaning, and you show how ultimately it applies to your son and to us as um, your children as well, Lord, that that we have been commissioned to so great a task is um, scary, but to know that we've been equipped and empowered by your spirit to accomplish that task, um, we are grateful and we rejoice in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.